We began in, in, in which the instance in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which a woman approached Aisha radiallahu anha and the woman was with her daughters and she was in need of charity. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she didn't have much during that particular time. She had one date to give the woman. So the woman took the date and she split the date in two parts. She gave one child one part of the date and gave the other child another part of the date. And the woman herself did not partake in any part of the date. She prioritized the needs of her young daughters above hers. Aisha radiallahu anha was so impressed by the actions of this woman, she told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he replied, Manibatulia min al banati bi shay, fa ahsana ilayhinna kunna lahu sitran min al nam. He says that whoever is tested, listen to the language here, who is, whoever is tested with daughters and treats them with excellence, with ihsan, right? they will become that person's shield between themselves and the fire. So we see a few things going on here is that, first of all, our young children are a test. They're a test. Alhamdulillah, Bala and Hassan has a beautiful test. What's your name, young sir? Musa? Musa is a beautiful test. Who's, where's his father at? He's a beautiful, he's a beautiful test, alhamdulillah. So our children are our test, but also if we treat them with excellence, if you pass the test by treating them with excellence, then they become your protection from the fire, ultimately, essentially, you're a key into the door of paradise, alhamdulillah. So he's your test, he's your test, but also, a key into one of the doors of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our young children. Sameen. When we think about our young people, how they have to struggle with their Muslim identity. I, I spent a long time really studying in book after book, looking at the studies in regards to Muslim identity. For myself, I was curious on how am I still Muslim 20s, 30s, and, and going into, I'm not gonna go further than that. We're gonna leave it at that. We're gonna keep me in my 30s, right? Now, as I get older, but I'm looking at my friends that I grew up with, with names like Abdullah and names like Mustafa and so on and so forth. What happened to them? Why were they not able to hold on to their Muslim identity? This is a struggle. It's our struggle during this day and time. And, and the fight that we have to realize is in identity. You know, our young children, they're in environments a lot of times where now they're redefining pronouns, right? They're redefining pronouns, putting, uh, categorizing themselves. You know, people, they want to come up with their own categories. It's about identity. People know how identity works, but as a Muslim community, do we know how identity works? And this is important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, إِنَّ الْخَاسِرِينَ الَّذِينَ خَاسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَهْلِيهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ That he says that indeed the losers are the ones who lose themselves as well as their families on the day of resurrection. We don't want to be amongst those who lose their families. You know, we look at our young people growing up in this world, our vision should be for them to be Muslim, be born Muslim, but also die upon Deen al -Haq. We want them to remain Muslim in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, so on and so forth, and in, in 80s, and however Allah chooses them to, to live. We want them to be Muslim throughout that duration. And this is our challenge. Our challenge during this day and time is identity. So this is our brief talk is going to be on identity. I want to ask you all a quick question. What does identity mean to you all? 
Come on, scholar. We're going to leave out of here scholars of identity. And if I had time, I'll set up a table and we'll give our diplomas to all of you all as you make your exit, if we had time for that. But we're going to leave out of here scholars of identity. What does identity mean? How I identify myself, how I see myself. Your characteristics, what else? All of this. Your values, right? Your beliefs, values. What else? This is a good one too. How people look at me, right? How I look at myself, how people look at me. Now when we think about identity, just on a basic level, it's the answer to the question, who am I? Who am I? You know? My curiosity was peaked in one particular incident. So I'm an imam in South Central LA on Crenshaw and Slauson. And if you don't know anything about Crenshaw and Slauson, say Alhamdulillah. <laughs> on Crenshaw and Slauson, there was a, a huge occurrence. A famous rapper was killed. He was murdered. During this particular time, after his death, there was a huge peace treaty between the local gangs, the Crips and the Bloods and the Pyrus. And I know I'm bringing LA here, but be patient with me, okay? I know Dallas has another culture. If I come to a place, I, ha I, I, I know nothing except my environment, so I bring that a little bit here for lessons, right? So you have people coming uh, 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 to this particular event, and these are young African-American, black American males that look like me. And I was perplexed because it's thousands of young men that look like me who are, have membership in the games. And I begin to ask the question, why has not the masjid been this effective as the games? And what I had to realize is that there is some missing components that the gangs have, that the gangs have, that the masjid does not have. And I began to, to search for answers and study this in this field of identity development, but through the lens of Quran and Sunnah. What we know about identity is that what's very important in regards to identity is your environment. You all are what we would call socializing agents. Everyone say, I'm a socializing agent. I'm not trying to recruit you into anything. <laughs> I know you all are worried. Some of you all are worried. What is he recruiting me into, right? We are socializing agents, right? We construct the environments in which our children's identity develops. We have to understand that. You know, a lot of times we blame the actor. We blame the person when they drop out of the masjid. We blame that individual, the actor. No. Who should take responsibility when someone drops out of the Muslim identity, when they drop out of the masjid? The who? The socializing agents. All of us, right? All of us. We think about how our environment impacts the internal state of a person. We look at Hanbala al Usayyidi during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's in a gathering and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's talking about Jannah and Jahannam. And Hanbala says, it's as if I can see Jannah and Jahannam the way he's describing it. And then he says, I went home to my family begin laughing and playing, and that state was lost. So Handelab exited his home, right? He's confused about his state. Nafaka Handelab, he's going around saying, Handelab has become a hypocrite. Handelab is a hypocrite. He runs into Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu and then they go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a state of confusion, that Handala has become a hypocrite. 
Right? And the Prophet وسلم, he said, if it's as if you describe the angels will shake hands with you in your beds and in the streets, but he summed it all up for him, how life works. Right? He says, Ya Hamdullah, Sa'atun wa right? There's a time for this and there's a time for that. What I want us to notice about this is the change in state in regards to Handala, how he felt one way around the masjid and around the, in the company of the Prophet وسلم, in his state around the family, his family. Our identities hinge on the company that we keep. This is important. When we think about identity, identity functions off of triggers. It functions off of triggers. If I don't get a trigger for my Muslim identity, there's nothing to bring my Muslim identity to my conscious mind. You know, what's so beautiful, Alhamdulillah, I grew up with a beautiful father, a great father and a great mother. My father would call me in the middle of the day, you know, this is when the cell phones was huge. I'm 16 years old, put this block up to my ear, right? And just say, Assalamu Alaikum. He's triggering my identity. I'm around the wrong bad company, right? I'm in these streets, I'm running with my friends. Assalamu Alaikum. And it triggers, it brings, it's reminding me you're Muslim, right? If I'm out, I run into my father's friend, right? I ran into one of his friends, I'm out with my friends. And I ran into my father's friends. Jihad, assalamu alaikum. He reminded me, you're Muslim. It's a trigger. Our identities function off of triggers. And let me give you an example of these triggers. Let's take, do we have a Mustafa in the room? Good. Oh, you? Oh, okay, okay. We're gonna leave that alone then, okay? Uh, let me see. Uh, Saeed, do we have a Saeed in the room? Okay, good. I don't want no one thinking I'm talking about them. Let's take the example of Saeed, right? Saeed has two identities because remember, all of us have multiple identities. I'm an Imam, but I'm also a father, right? You know, when I'm in shape, I'm a runner. You know, I, I was a runner about two years ago, running my three miles a day. I considered myself a runner. I was really getting into it, right? I don't know what happened, you know. But that's another conversation. But we all have multiple identities. We have to understand that. And some identities are higher than the others, according to the strength of the socializing agents. So let's take the instance of Saeed. Saeed has these two prominent identities in his life. One is he's an avid sports fan. But Saeed is also a student of the Arabic language. Saeed runs into a dilemma. On Sunday at 11 a.m. is the Arabic class. But on Sunday at 11 a.m., Saeed's favorite team is playing. Which one is he going to choose? That's my question to you all. Which one is he going to choose? <laughs> Come on, Saeed, his name is Saeed, you know. Which one you all think? The game? L listen. <laughs> he's, he's bringing in something, another layer to our conversation. Now, let me, let me break it down. Listen, first of all, you all are answering the question. You all have no data. You have no data. You just, it's an emotional answer. You know, the game. The, no, that's emotions. We, we have to function off of data. You know, we, we have to be an intellectual Muslim community. Not all these emotions functioning off of data. Let me give you the data right here. Saeed wakes up Monday morning on his timeline. Your favorite team is playing. He walks outside a billboard. Your favorite team is playing. He goes further. Someone says, are you going to watch your favorite team play this Sunday at 11 a.m.? And Saeed receives those triggers all throughout the week. Then finally, 
on Sunday or on Friday after Salat al Jumu'ah, here comes the board member announcing the Arabic class this Sunday at 11 a.m. Now we have the data. Which one is Saeed going to choose? <laughs> we have the data in. We can predict his behavior. <laughs> he's going to choose which one? He's still, he, he's still optimistic. He's still emotional. <laughs> Listen, our children are struggling. We have to be real about this. The amount of triggers that they are receiving in this day and time for identities that contradict their Muslim identity, they're being bombarded. So the studies, the data says that Saeed, because of the amount of triggers that he's receiving, and ultimately it's Allah's decision, but if we look and predict the data, is that the socializing agents weren't putting in the work that they needed to put in. So Saeed is going to end up choosing the game, okay? He's going to end up choosing the game because of being bombarded by the triggers. I want to close off with something. I told you all I'm going to leave you with enough. We're going to consider ourselves scholars of identity. I'm going to close off with, what's your name, young man again? Musa. You all have to, and I'm, I'm purposely bringing out and highlighting Musa because all of us need to know his name because we are what? Socializing agents. We are essentially going to construct the environment that's going to predict whether Musa stays within this in particular uh, um, environment. Now Musa, this is our saying that you're going to remind me of. Everyone needs a car. Okay, so remember that. I'm going to look back at and depend on you to, because I, I, my memory is not good, so I need you to provide that for me when it's time, okay? Okay, what's our saying? <laughs> what's our saying? Everyone needs a car. Say that. Okay, you're going to remind, that's our saying. Okay, we're going to, okay. Okay. So, our environments, in order for our environments to be viable in regards to identity development, I'm going to give you some studies, is that first of all, you all must provide what we would call competence. Everyone say competence. Okay, competence is the feeling that I can be successful in this. I can flourish in this environment. I can reach levels of mastery in regards to socially in this environment. And competence, how competence works is that if I don't feel I'm going to be successful in something, I'm not going to do it. This is how the human being is wired. So for example, I got a call not too long ago. And they said, Jihad, let's go play some basketball. You know, I'm getting older, right? Little out of shape, hitting the table too hard. I told him, no, I'm not playing basketball. I'm busy. And then I got a call not too long after that. Imam Jihad, we need you to deliver a lecture. Okay, give me the time and place. I'll be there. In regards to basketball, I didn't feel competent. I didn't feel I can be successful. You know, lower back pain, the little things that's happening as you get older. But in regards to lecture, I do this pretty often, right? And I, I, I've been countless places giving lectures. So that was the easy one. We have to provide our young people with support in regards to competence. The Prophet wasallam, if we can see, even during his time, he had to deal with the people feeling discouraged, not feeling competent. You know, we take, for example, the individuals, the fuqara, the masakin, the people who were poor how the Prophet وسلم, he had to hear them and their complaints in regards to them saying, so-and-so is able to give in charity, we're not able to give. And the Prophet وسلم, him having these instances where he's going up to a group of poor people, 
And he says, don't you all realize that poor people will enter into Jannah 500 years before the rich, right? Immediately giving them that competent support where they feel like we can take on this title of being a good Muslim. If our young people don't feel like they can be good Muslims in this environment, then you're gonna find them looking for identities in which that offer them competence. The Prophet Wasallam also was like this with those who felt that they had an intellectual deficiency. So for example, there were individuals such as Ibn Mas'ud and, and uh, Abdullah bin Amr who they were able to read and memorize the Quran utilizing their, uh, their youth, right, zealousness. And there were groups though that felt deficient and the Prophet Wasallam, it was as if he knows the individuals who felt deficient and he went and made a short statement to build them up quickly. And for example, he went to a group who perhaps was feeling deficient and he said, who wants to recite a third of the Quran? Who wants to recite a third of the Quran? And they said, how can we do this? And the Prophet Wasallam gave him which chapter of Quran to recite? Surah Al-Ikhlas, right? Kul huwa Allahu Ahad, one of the shortest chapters in Quran. Giving them what type of support? Competence, competence support. The Prophet Sallallahu was a master at this. If we look at the narrations on how he built people up, if we look at Bilal bin Rabah in the more, in the morning time, we have no idea what the details aren't there in regards to how Bilal was feeling, what he needed at that moment. But I assume that what the Prophet Wasallam is giving him is what he needs. He going, uh, the Prophet Wasallam going to Bilal bin Rabah and saying, I heard your footsteps are ahead of mine in Jannah, in paradise. I want friends like this who build me up and not destroy my competence in the religious space. It's important. You know, I had this growing up. My, my father never made me feel like an incompetent Muslim, that I, was never, that I wasn't good enough, no matter what state I was in. You know, I recall that I was going through a little phase. I, was, I had my little phase, right? i never forget, I'm in the masjid, my pants sagging and earrings in my ear, and my father's the man, which I look crazy <laughs> when I think about it, but my father never made me feel like an incompetent Muslim. He would introduce me to his friends in that state that I was in. He would say, this is my son, Jihad, he's my role model. He's my role model, building me up. You know, sometimes, my daughter, right, I never want her feeling like an incompetent Muslim, but I don't agree with all the trends that she latches on to. But I have to realize I'm a socializing agent. We're socializing agent. We blame the actor. When we're the one paying for the phone bill, right? We're the one paying their bill so they can utilize their, their phone, right? We're the one paying for the bill in regards to the internet, okay? So everyone say competence. Okay, our next one that you must provide in the religious space is autonomy. Everyone say autonomy. Now autonomy is when you're not compelling or forcing someone. You have to allow people to choose their path in regards to the deen. Of course, you set up your influences, but if a person, your children, don't want to go that particular direction, you will, if you compel them, they'll opt out of the religious environment. So the Prophet Sallallahu one of the young companions, Abdullah bin Amr, he wanted to memorize, he wanted to recite the entire Quran in one sitting. The Prophet Sallallahu got wind of this and he went and he negotiated with him. He negotiated with him, okay? So, and it, he got it down. He first started off with 30 days. What about reciting the Quran in 30, in 30 days, then 20 days, then he went down and they eventually got to seven, right? So that's autonomy. I'll give you an example. In my religious uh, space at Isla Lay in Los Angeles, 
there's a, a, a brother there, right, that he, to be frank with you all, his tajweed sucks, right? But his barbecue, alhamdulillah, mashallah, okay? He is still a good Muslim. We can't look at him as a, as a terrible Muslim, and nor would I want him to feel like that, exiting, uh, uh, leaving the, the masjid, feeling down and discouraged. What he does is so essential for our community in providing and catering good meals. And we don't want the person who has good tajweed to be on the barbecue pit. You stay in a lane. People should choose their path as long as it's within the realm of the halal, right? The permissible, okay? So autonomy is important. Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, they asked him, why don't you fast more? He says, I love reciting the Quran, right? When I fast, it weakens me in regards to reciting the Quran. And then uh, relatedness, everyone say relatedness. Relatedness is this connection we must have. All of us must have this relatedness. We must connect. The Prophet Sallallahu in one hadith, Kun fi dunya ka anna sabil. He said, be in this life as a stranger or a traveler on the path. Before this particular narration, he's in, at the beginning, أَخَذَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِمَنْ كِبِيرٍ It says that the Prophet Sallallahu he grabbed the hold of the shoulder of Ibn Umar connecting with him. He's connecting with him. This relatedness and connection, we need to know, what's his name again? Musa by his name and connect with who? Musa. Okay? You all are socializing agents of Musa. And what's our saying? Everyone needs a car. The C is for what? Competence. The A is for what? And the R is for what? Relatedness. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feekum. Wa jazakumullahu khayran. This is a beautiful community. You all stay strong. Keep your bonds strong. When you build strong community, that is fostering an environment where we can see our young children be Muslim, be born Muslim, and remain Muslim until they exit this earth. May Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna al Muslimina wal Muslimati wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minati wal Qanitina wal Qanitati wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqati wal Sabirina wal Sabirati wal Khashi'ina wal Khashi'at wal Khashi'ina wal Khashi'at wal Mutasaddiqina wal Mutasaddiqati wal Sa'imina wal Sa'imat wal Hafidina furujahum wal Hafidati wal Dhakirina Allah kathiran wal Dhakirat أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما